Amen. Good morning, everyone, and morning to those online. And I just want to say uh, from Psalm 92, it is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy at what your hands have done, how profound your thoughts. And I just think that this morning is a great day to praise the Lord. It's great to have Gerilyn and Lionel back and Cheryl and, and others. It's great to have a team here. And it's, it's really good to praise the Lord with all of you. So welcome to the well where we're drawing people to God. We welcome those online. And uh, we're just thrilled that you guys are here with us to worship this morning. I want to make a few announcements uh, real quick. Just so you know, there are some new resources. We're going to be going around town with our mission team that's here, and I hope that you get a chance to meet them and, and know them. And um, it is really neat that they're going to be helping us really bathe this in prayer as we go to really draw people back to God and really relaunch the well. And so we've got some resources. For those of you that this is your church, we've got some little business cards uh, that actually are just a normal business card on the front, and it has the time of the worship. But on the back, it says, I love my church because, and it's for you to fill in something personal and put your name at the bottom. So when somebody comes to church, they can connect with you by name and have met you before. So it's really just a tool for you to go and invite people and tell them why you love being part of God's church here at the well. The other thing is we do have postcards that we'll be handing out as well as door hangers. And so if you're interested in helping us with this and, and really passing the message about the well and helping us relaunch, we would invite that. And there is some uh, some of these resources back on the welcome table uh, to pick up if you're interested. But again, we just welcome you being here. And um, there's one thing that I want to do, and they don't know I'm going to do this. And I don't even know if they know that this is actually a reality. But there's a picture, a little slideshow up here I want you to see for a certain group of people that is here. Immediately, some people might know what this is, but... There is a church represented here, Ridge Community Church. We want to say thank you very much for getting this started, uh, for raising the money. And uh, we had someone match the money and donate. And this, this tractor is literally on its way here right now. And so thank you to the Ridge Community Church. You guys are awesome. Um, it is going to be such a blessing. Uh, the people are fixing it up. They're putting the mower deck on it. They're putting the forks on it and all of that is uh, coming. So we just want to say a big shout out to the Ridge for just being um, here today and being here. And we wish we could have got it here for your time that you're here, but it will be here mid-June. So uh, super excited that you guys were the ones to really kick that off for us. And that is going to be such a huge blessing to Lifeline and the ministry here. So thank you guys very much. And uh, we appreciate you. So the rest of you at the church, like, why in the world would you want a tractor? And that's probably what they said. But, um, you know, it says, like, a tractor? Seriously? Um, but you see the amount of property we have now. You see all the bushes and the weeds that are cropping up. And, and as soon as we get rain, it's going to just, you know, all kinds of weeds. And it's a miserable task trying to cut all these things down with weed whackers and hands and shovels. So this will be a huge help in keeping the school grounds nice and helping us uh, really do some work that needs to be done around here. So huge thank you. Uh, we're excited that this is actually a reality, and um, this has been a huge blessing, so thank you. Um, let's just pray, and we have a lot today to be thankful for, and so we're going to be praising God and uh, just enjoy the worship that we have here with our Father. Uh, God, we come to you and just thank you for this time. We thank you that we can lift your name up. We can praise you and we thank you for the efforts of those that have donated, those that have put into making this tractor a reality. But God, we know that you are the one that provides everything that we need. And we know that you are the one that orchestrates the people that need to come together and how all this works. And we thank you for those that are here, those that are online, and that we can worship you together and just lift our voices together as one voice, praising your name on high. God, we love you so much, and we just thank you for this time that we can celebrate you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to stand and worship, you're welcome to, um, or sit in your seat, whatever's comfortable, but we're going to praise God together. Jesus, let your kingdom come here. 
Thank you. 
All right, you may be seated. During this time, we take each week to remember what Jesus has done for us. And so we encourage you, if you have not done so, there are cups for communion right here in the back. If you're online, we just take this time to go grab something that you can share with us in this time of communion. We take this each and every week because we remember what Jesus has done and how important it is for us to stop everything right now and just focus on Jesus. And so there's going to be a video that plays, and I just encourage you during this video just to take a moment and slow down your breathing, focus on Christ, and just be in awe of what he's done for us. So as we watch this, let's take communion together. resurrection father there's no reason for us to even be here in this capacity and so father we just thank you for this time together that we may remember you examine ourselves proclaim your death and father we look forward to sharing this with you once again someday father we love you again we just thank you for jesus and we just pray right now that we would continue to worship you and that we would continue to seek you this day it's in jesus name we pray amen 
our time of offering. If you're online, there are four different ways you can give. I encourage you to do that. Um, if you're here in person, there is an offering box at the plate anytime during the service. If you feel like giving and God moves you to do that, there is a black box back there next to where the communion is located that you're willing to drop your offering in there at any time. Thank you again. Let's just continue our worship as we seek Jesus during this time. It's good to be with you once again, and we're going through the book of Mark. We'll be in chapter 9 if you want to turn there in your Bibles, your phones, or uh, just watch on the screen. You, know, you have uh, lots of choices there, but if you need a Bible, there are some Bibles on the back table. We encourage you to grab one of those and take it with you as our gift to you. And so we just thank you for being here. I'm going to be uh, you know, really honest that some of you have, have missed out on chapters 1 through 8, but uh, we're jumping into chapter 9 with the book of Mark, and uh, we're going to be looking at this now. This is one of those topics that is somewhat difficult to explain here in the United States. And so I want to take a moment and really try to get your mind wrapped around what is the kingdom of God. Now, in chapter 9, we are jumping into this and we go into what's called the transfiguration. There's a big word for you that we don't use in everyday language. But the transfiguration, we're going to read this and look at what it says and, and really look at this in light of what is God's kingdom coming with power. And that's what I want you to look at and focus on. But as we get into this, I want you to know that chapter 8 and chapter 7 and chapter 6, all of these are leading up to this moment. And I don't believe that this could actually take place until Peter's confession in the chapter before where he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
finally they see clearly who Jesus is. Now, that doesn't mean they get it completely. In fact, you're going to find that even Peter says some pretty surprising things that you just shake your head and think, how in the world could they be this dull? I mean, even Jesus called them dull. You know, but I put myself in their shoes and I really think, would I do anything really different? And the answer is probably no. I would probably just be as dull as they are and go along. And Because uh, I, I really think that these guys were normal people. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. You know, the people that are grungy and dirty at times. And, you know, I love fishing. I don't like taxes, but I do love fishing. And I could relate to some of these guys, you know, and the stories they tell and things they do. And sometimes we're not, you know, all there. Our minds are on fishing, not transfiguration, you know, or, or kingdom, or people, you know, kings that are invited us to study under them. That, that's just foreign to us at times, and that's exactly what happened to these guys, really taken from what they've known into a world that is totally different than what they expected. Jack and I joke all the time about some of the things that we see in here that are just humorous, because Jesus, looking at these guys, you can just imagine him putting his head in his hands and just you know, holding onto his forehead and like, oh, these guys, I don't know if I'm going to die on the cross or from these guys. You know, it's just, you know, you wonder sometimes what he was thinking working with these men. But as we get into chapter 9, I hope that you have a clear understanding really of who Jesus is. And, that, and last week I asked you to ask that question of yourself. And I know most of the room wasn't here, but last week I asked them to really reflect who do you say that Jesus is and really pray is there anything that's keeping me from giving everything to Jesus is there really anything that keeps me from following him with everything my mod my body my mind my soul what is holding me back and in this week, we're going to revisit the teaching of the kingdom of God. We touched on it in chapter 4 as we looked at the different parables Jesus had of the kingdom. But now we're going to jump into this once again and define and try to pick apart what is the kingdom of God. Now, I used several different resources. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It's called the Discipleship Gospel. And uh, one of our tools that we use for discipling is the Discipleship Gospel Workbook, and it is all going through the book of Mark, and, and it's really pulling out all the key teachings of Jesus' gospel. And let me just remind you, the gospel definition, in my words, is God loves us so much that he meets us in our brokenness. He stepped into our world through Jesus, his one and only Son, to come and meet us where we are. He surprises us with his love and willingness to offer life. As the anointed king, Jesus welcomes all who believe and turn away from their past life and disobedience to him. He asks us to choose to follow him and trust him more than anything in this world. He rescued us by giving his life for ours. He then rose from the dead as a king that conquers the enemy to give us life through his life. And he promises to one day return for all who follow him to live with him forever in his kingdom. And I just want you to know that this kingdom, this gospel that we preach and this gospel that we believe in, the good news, is not something that's just for a select few. This is something that Jesus has offered to all of us who believe, who repent, who follow him. And this kingdom that he talks about, sometimes I feel like we don't quite resonate with what kingdom really means. After all, we don't live in the kingdom like you would think of with a king. We live in this United States, we call it free, but when we think of king and, and all that, we think of Europe, we think of other countries, we don't think of what we live in. But we watch a lot of movies that talk about kingdom, uh, and some of you, probably more than others, that can relate with Lord of the Rings, uh, Princess Bride, The Hobbit, The Chronicles of Narnia, maybe Star Wars, you know, a lot of these sci-fi movies really pull out the, and fantasy movies pull out the idea of kingdom. You know, but I think of when I say the word kingdom, castles and, you know, land and people and peasants and, you know, this split between nobility and, and these poor people that are living outside the walls of the castle. And, and my mind goes to these images, and it probably shouldn't. But imagine for a moment that you live in this kingdom, 
Let's, I don't know how many of you are the fantasy type, Lord of the Rings, and, and the comedy type, like Princess Bride or other things. I don't know the breakup of this room. But let's suppose for a moment you picture a kingdom, and in any of these scenarios, the king issues a decree, and he says to all his people, and you're like, yeah, I, I, I like some of that, but I'm not going to really follow all that the king asked me to do. In fact, I'm just going to push back a little bit and say, no, my ideas are better than the king. Do you think that would fly in any of those movies with the kingdoms? You know, the king's rule is rule. And, and if you go back to even, um, you know, Alice in Wonderland, you've got the evil kingdom and the, the bad queen and the good queen. If you go against the bad queen, it's off with your head. You know, it's, it's really not a good scenario. And so we recognize from these movies what a kingdom is like, but we don't really ever put ourselves in those scenarios because it's kind of foreign to us. And I really think we don't spend a lot of time talking about it. So today, I'm going to give you kind of a barrage of things that really help you define what kingdom is. Now, I pulled some things from Mark chapter 4, and we're going to look at Mark chapter 9. We're going to pull some things from different quotes that I want to give you as well. But I love this quote from Frederick Beekner. Now, I had to look up the spelling or the pronunciation of this because that's not what I was going with. But I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy, but I love what he says here. The kingdom of God is where we belong. It is home. It is whether we realize it or not, it, and it is whether we realize it or not, I think we're all of us homesick for it. And yes, that's worded like that. It's just hard to read. I think we are, all of us, homesick for it. And whether we realize it or not, that is what we are being pulled to. It's being what we're longing for, what we desire. And like I said, some of us don't even realize it. We just know that something is missing, and God is inviting us to be part of that kingdom where he dwells and he reigns and he rules. And so when we look at this and say, what is the kingdom of God? Well, we see in Mark chapter 4 the teaching of the lamp on the stand where it's visible for everyone to see. It's something that is meant to be seen. It's something that should be visible, especially in our lives and in the churches. It should be something that people are drawn to, just like the lamp on the stand. The, peep, the parable of the growing seed and the mustard seed starting out small and becoming big. And it might start out with just one or two, but it becomes big and it grows. But we don't know how because it's not up to us. It's up to God. And we see the kingdom of God growing. Now, what I also want you to remember is the kingdom of God is simply this. It's where the rule of God exists. That's as simple as I can put it. It's where the rule of God exists, where the reign of God exists. It is here now, and it is also something to come. We use that word in our reading of Scripture. We talk about it when we talk about God. But have we really let in the sinking deep meaning of the kingdom of God? The rule of God, where is that in your life? Where is that in your daily life? Not just here on Sunday morning, but when you do a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, do you think about how you are living in and amongst the kingdom of God and God is in you and everything you do is in God's reign and rule within his kingdom? You know, like I said in the beginning, I think sometimes when we talk about the kingdom of God, we think, oh, well, that's probably for the best Christians or the elite. You know, that if it was a kingdom, I would be in the peasants outside, you know, where they rock around and say, bring out your dead. You know, I would be that person, you know, living out there. I wouldn't be in the walls in the niceness of the kingdom. But it's not for the elite. In fact, I love what Brendan Manning says in the Ragamuffin Gospel. He says, The kingdom is not an exclusive, well-trimmed suburb with snobbish rules about who can live there. No, it's larger, homelier, less self-conscious cast of people who understand that they are sinners because they have experienced the yaw and pitch of moral struggle. It's everybody. It's for everyone, and, and Jesus is inviting us into this kingdom, and it's meant for everyone, not just for the elite. So when Jesus directs us to pray, when we see that Lord's Prayer or the model prayer that Jesus gives, he, sa he says, pray that thy kingdom will come. Yeah, I default to the King James. That's how I learned it. Um, but thy kingdom come, right? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray thy kingdom come, it doesn't mean that we should pray for it to come into existence, 
Rather, we pray for it to take over all points in our personal, social, political order where it is now excluded, on earth as it is in heaven. With this prayer, we are invoking it as faith. We are acting it into the real world of our daily existence, Dallas Willard says. The greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreak needs is whether those who by profession or culture are identified as Christians will become disciples, students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of kingdom of the heavens into every corner of human existence. And that's another quote by Dallas Willard. And I don't know if you know him or not, but it's it just, I love some of the way he puts the understanding of the kingdom of God. Now, he did say kingdom of heaven, which brings me to a point. If you are doing some research and you see Matthew doing kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, and what's the difference? There isn't one. You got to remember, Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience. They don't use the word God. They don't speak God's name. And so kingdom of heaven was a safer way of explaining this. But it's the same thing. When we use kingdom of heaven, we are saying kingdom of God either way. So this is taken from a book called The Kingdom or Gospel of the Kingdom by George Eldon Ladd. He says this, Then came Jesus of Nazareth with the announcement, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The theme of the coming of the kingdom was central in his mission. His teaching was designed to show men that they might enter the kingdom of God. His mighty works were intended to prove that the kingdom of God had come upon them. He, his parables illustrated to his disciples the truth about the kingdom of God. And when he taught his followers to pray, at the heart of their petition were the words, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On the eve of his death, he assured his disciples that he would yet share with them in the happiness and the fellowship of the kingdom. And he promised that he'd appear again to them on earth, appear on earth in glory, bringing the blessedness of the kingdom for those it was prepared. Now, I want to show you that quote that I have there. I broke it down for you. In the beginning, it, it really talks about Jesus came with the announcement, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Do you see that? That's hard whenever it's, okay, well, it's in there, um, but we'll find it one of these days. Another facet of the kingdom I want you to understand is the realm into which the followers of Jesus Christ have entered. Paul writes that God has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. We know that there are so many teachings of kingdom throughout scripture. We know that the kingdom of God is his kingship, his rule, and his authority. And that is absolutely key. When once this is realized, we can go through the New Testament and we can find passage after passage where the meaning is evident about the kingdom. The kingdom is not a realm or, or just a people, but God's reign, as I mentioned before. Jesus said that we must receive the kingdom of God as little children in Mark 10, 15. What is received? The church? Heaven? What is received is God's rule over our life. In order to enter the future realm of the kingdom, one must submit himself in perfect trust to God's rule here and now. In Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 2, let's go through this together because I want you to see the kingdom of God coming with power. And it says this in Mark 9, verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up to a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And they appeared before them, Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they, were, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what risen from the dead meant. And they asked him, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? 
But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they've done to him everything they wish, just as it is written about him. You know, this story, you might be thinking, you know, how does this deal with the kingdom of God? But I want you to see it from Peter's perspective. Now, Peter writes about this in 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18, and this is what he says about this experience. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. Now, Peter is describing this event, and he's using words like majesty, sacred, glorious. He's using words to describe everything from God to give credit to whom Jesus was. Now, Peter cracks me up because in this moment, he could think of nothing else than, let's put up some tents, you know, <laughs> and let's just have some tents and everybody just hang out. You know, it's good for us to be here right now. And he's really excited about this, but he's also terrified, as the scripture tells us. He didn't know what to say. But I think in that moment, you know, he is seeing something that is just unlike anything he's ever seen. He's experienced something unlike anything he's ever experienced. And Peter, James, and John are in this inner circle witnessing the kingdom of God in its, all its glory, all its power right in that moment. And I believe when we see Peter's description of this, he's using the most majestic, most powerful, most amazing words he can come up with. He doesn't have any other words other than let's just give God all the glory for what's happened here. It was majestic. It was powerful. It was glorious. It was everything that I can describe doesn't have the words big enough to describe it other than please know we're not making this up. We heard it with our own ears. We've seen it with our own eyes. It's absolutely amazing. And this transfiguration in chapter 9, when we see it, is all about God's kingdom being coming with power and giving authority to Christ, the anointed king. You see, again, I don't think this could have happened had Peter and the disciples not declared that Jesus was the Christ. I believe that the order of this and the timing of this was God's perfection, knowing that the time was right, that their eyes are now opened. As I mentioned on Wednesday night, when you look at Mark chapter 8, the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida is perfect because it was showing that the, you know, it took two times for this person to finally see. And it was a great illustration of the disciples who struggled to see clearly who Jesus was. And finally, they were able to see clearly who Jesus was. Just as the man that was blind, Jesus healed him because I, I see tall trees like men walking around. And Jesus, you know, spit on him again and, and touched him, and all of a sudden he could see clearly. And I don't think that's a coincidence that that passage is right before the disciples, who still were struggling to understand Jesus, now finally see clearly Jesus is the anointed king, the Messiah, the Christ. And when we see that, we now have the transfiguration coming with power, affirming who Jesus is, and yet, Peter, James, and John still are struggling, trying to understand, what is this about rising from the dead? You see, Jesus is starting to have those conversations that he must die and that he'll rise from the dead. Remember, Peter just got rebuked for that because he was trying to push on Jesus. Oh, you're not going to die. You know, we'll protect you. Or no, it's not going to happen. Kings don't die. And Jesus turned around and said, get behind me, Satan. You have the things of men, not of God. And Peter was just rebuked for that, and he's going up in the mountain, he's affirmed, uh, he sees this and he knows that Jesus is affirmed, and he comes down, and he's still struggling with this resurrection idea. Because if he rises from the dead, that means he's dead. How is this even possible? And so these guys are still wrestling with this, but the identity of Jesus is not in question at this point. He knows who he is. But we know from Peter he will still go on to deny him later on. And that's the thing that I wrestle with in this, is I look at these guys, and I know that they are struggling. I know that they're trying to understand what Jesus is teaching, but they are willing to follow no matter what. 
And yet when they are following, they are seeing some things that are absolutely amazing that they can't even put words to. But yet they know this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. And when I think about this and when I think of the kingdom of God, one of the things I try to relate is what are we seeing in this moment? And when I look at this, I I think in Mark 9, we see that Jesus revealed God's kingdom with power. Being a follower of Jesus means you accept the truth that Jesus is God's king and believe in the reality of God's kingdom when you consider God's kingdom has already come. It's helpful to know this, wherever Christ rules, there is God's kingdom. And so God's kingdom is here. Jesus is king. Christ rules his gospel, his followers, his church. Where is Jesus' reach and reign as us as believers? And we have known, especially those of us who have been Christian, about following Jesus. We have known and we've heard that we must be obedient. We've heard that we must follow, that we must take up our cross daily and follow him. We read that just last week. And so when we're looking at this and we're seeing the idea of the kingdom, what keeps us from actually believing the prayer that we pray in the Lord's Prayer? That's a question that we need to wrestle with. Because I want you to do this. As you start praying this prayer in Matthew 6, 9 through 13, let's look at it together. It says this, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. (laughs) There I go again. I memorized it in the King James. I can't get away from it. Uh, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now when we look at that prayer, many of us know that by heart. Many of us have said that in church. Many of us said that in different places. Some of you may have never realized that before. I understand. But in the beginning of that, it says that we pray that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. So this week when you pray this, which I want you to do, I want you to go to that passage and I want you to really soak this in and use this as part of your prayer life. The first thing I want you to do is express your faith in Jesus as king. The second thing I want you to do is invite Jesus to rule over every area of your life. And then I want you to pray for God's eternal kingdom to come and commit to declare the gospel of the kingdom now. Commit that you are willing to spread the kingdom of God's gospel, the Jesus that we know right now. Because people can be involved in this kingdom now by accepting Jesus Christ and they have something to look forward to when the kingdom comes in all its glory. The kingdom of God is something that we need to wrestle with. Because if you are really saying that, Jesus, you are king, you are Lord of my life, if you're really saying that and you say that you follow Jesus, then that means he rules and reigns over every part of your life. What area of your life are you holding back? What area of your life are you struggling to surrender? Because you can't have a king and yet say, well, I really want to be king too. You can't have a king and a kingdom and say, well, I like this part of the king and this part of the kingdom, but I really don't like this, so let me be king of this area of my life. It doesn't work like that. If we're part of God's kingdom and he really is the Messiah and he's the Christ, the son of the living God, then we have surrendered everything to him without condition, without excuse. He is Lord, period. He is the king, period. You are part of his kingdom, period. And we should live in this kingdom and glorify him and praise him and welcome him to reign and rule in every area of our life. And so we need to pray this this week, expressing our faith as Jesus is king, inviting Jesus to rule your life, praying for God's eternal kingdom to come. We still look forward to that day. (laughs) Oh, we look forward to that day. But where are we holding back And saying, you can have all of this in my life, but Jesus, I've got this. Because it doesn't work like that. He's either king or he's not. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word. And God, I I just love getting in here and, and looking at this. And I can only imagine 
what it was like in that moment with Peter, James, and John going up the mountain with you. And Father, you knew what was to come and you knew who would be there. And yet, I can just imagine the joy you must have felt for Peter, James, and John to experience that moment with you. To have that confirmation, to be able to have the Father speak in, that they would be able to hear exactly what was being said. And I know that Peter didn't get right, nor would we. We would screw up too and say something really weird. But Father, I just thank you that we can look at you and say, we believe and we welcome you into our life and we want you to be king over every area of our life. And Father, help us to surrender it all and not hold anything back. For God, you have told us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, be willing to die, willing to sacrifice our selfish desires for following you. And Father, I just pray that you would help us to truly do that. Father, as we pray this week and look into the model prayer that you've given to us, I pray that we would seek you and really pray that you would have complete rule over our lives. And so, Father, I just pray that that becomes our prayer this week as we seek you. Father, we love you so much. Help us to understand the kingdom. Help us to understand your reign and your rule. Help us to understand how it's now and yet something to come. And Father, help us proclaim it and not be ashamed. Help us to share the good news that you've given to us, that you came, you are the Christ, the King of your kingdom, that you died, that you were buried, that you rose again. And Father, you ask us to repent, turn away from the things that we have been holding on to. You've asked us to confess who you are. We know that, to say that we believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you've asked us to turn away from the worldly things to repent, to believe, and to follow you. Father, we know it's not about the things we do, but it's who we believe in. It's who we make Lord and King of our life. Father, may we surrender to that right now. We love you. We thank you so much for this time. We just pray that you'd move in our hearts, that you would break away the, the shell and the hardness And just like we read in the Psalms last week, that, Father, you would take away our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh that's soft and ready to receive you. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. And I pray that you would just help us to see clearly right now who you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need to talk, if you need to pray, if you have a decision to make for Jesus, please let just let me know. I'll be in the back right now and just be ready to pray with any of you if you're interested. Um, Just know that we love you. We thank you for being here today. And uh, as we close in this last worship song, really make it your prayer to seek God in everything that you do. Let's worship together. God of creation, There at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light. And as you speak, billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath the planets form if the stars were made to worship so will I I can see your heart in everything you've made every bird star, a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. your promise you 
don't speak in vain the syllable empty or void for once you have spoken all nature and science follow the sound of your voice and as you Catch your breath, evolving in pursuit of what you said. If it all reveals your nature, so lie. I can see your heart in everything you say, every painted sky, a canvas of your grace if creation still obeys you so Thank you for that. Thank you for not leaving us behind, and thank you for loving us in the many ways that you do. Show us your glory, Lord. Show us this week. Just help us to be followers and servants of you this week and to remember that you're with us always. We love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen.
praise, there's rest for us.